This morning, as we come together for the reading and proclaiming of the Word of God, I want to share with you all just a little bit um, about the direction that we'll be going this morning. When we read God's Word, we have an opportunity to know more about God. God has given us his word that we might see him at least as much as we are able. If you remember back to Moses' day, whenever he went up into the mountain, he had a desire and he wanted to see God. And God said, you can't see me. My glory is too great. But I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock And as I pass by, I'll let you see just the backside of my glory. And when Moses came down, his face was shining so bright that they had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't look on him. We don't have the the pleasure, we don't have the privilege, we don't have the opportunity to be able to experience God that way today but we're going to be able to experience him that way soon. And here's the one thing that we can, and the way that we can experience, and we can see God's glory, and we can know more about God, and that is through our time in the Word of God. And we need to learn to grow in the richness of the Word of God applying that word to our lives that we might grow in our relationship with Christ, that we might begin to move forward and understand and to know more and to see more, just glimpses. I'll stand here today very, very plainly and very openly to you today and tell you that the more that I have learned and know of God, the more that I know that I don't know about God. Because God is so majestic, because God is so great, because God is so powerful. The more that I learn and the more in love I am with the Lord, the more I realize that there is a longing in my heart for the day that I will be able to stand face to face and to see my God and to be restored in that relationship with him. But for today, God allows us the opportunity to see him through his word. Words fail me to be able to tell you other than probably the best way that I could probably describe God today would be like a very, very, very fine diamond that has multiple facets to it that every time you look at God from a different perspective you see something different you see something new you see something beautiful and you see something that is precious and amazing and God gives us those glimpses in his word to come to that kind of understanding and to come to know him I've been reading and studying and 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 it was in the office and and thinking and praying about had some other sermon topics that I was looking at and I was getting enthralled with them and and really getting drawn into them. And then um, something happened. I got distracted for a little while. And then whenever I sat down, I picked up something else. And as I was looking at this other thing, all of a sudden there was a word that jumped out and I began, it's just almost an urgency to run, to sit down and to begin to open the Bible and to begin to look and to see and seek out. Because I realize something as many times as I've read these scriptures, I realize something about God that I had not, I had known kind of in the back crevices of my mind, but it came to the forefront and I'm probably going to be very inadequate in trying to uh, share it today, but I just pray that God through the Holy Spirit will come and speak to every one of your hearts today and will make his word and his understanding of who he is known to you today. And the word that I want to, that, that stood out to me as I was reading this passage of scripture was the justice of God. God is just. Now we don't think about that word a lot, but it is an important word. It is a legal terminology, and we'll explain more about that 
in a few moments. But the title for our message this morning is found in a passage of Scripture. I'm going to give you the title, and then we're going to go immediately into that passage of Scripture. So if you want to be turning to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, this is where our title is taken from today. And the title is simply this, The Just for the Unjust. The just was provided for the unjust. And in case you don't know who that is, that's us. We can all raise our hand because we are all unjust before God in our sins. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. I want you to pay close attention to that phrase, that he might bring us to God. Folks, we in our sin have no right, we have no authority, and we have no ability to come to God except through Jesus Christ. Regardless of all the different things and all the different ways that the world wants to tell us today and try to lead us astray, thinking that there's this way to get to God and that way to get to God, there's one way to get to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ and the propitiation that he provided for us. The word just, if you look the definition of, the word just is righteous, lawful, right, or fair. So keep that definition in your mind as we go through our service this morning. If you expand that word out from just to justice, justice is being righteous, rightfulness, reward or penalty as deserved. You keep that thought very near in your head because I want to tell you what we deserve in our sin. We deserve the punishment of hell. We deserve the wrath of God. But something came along and stepped in so that we did not have to have that penalty. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3, and you may say, Preacher, why are you always referring back to the book of Genesis to chapter 3? Because if we don't get chapter 3 of the book of Genesis right, if we don't get the understanding even of Genesis 1-1 right, then we are messed up all the way through the rest of the Bible. You cannot properly interpret the rest of the Bible if you do not have the foundational principles that are found in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. If we don't get those things right, if we don't strive and dig to understand everything that we can about the beginning of, of creation and about what God has done, then we're going to have a messed up view of things the rest of the way through and we will find that we'll be misinterpreting the Word of God in many ways as we study the Word of God. In the book of Genesis chapter 3, you find, and I, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to reference some things. Number one, we know what happens there. We find that that's the fall. Satan came to Eve and tempted Eve. God said you have everything except one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan's trick, just like Satan's trick is today, is to try to bring a shortcut. God told Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Satan's, Satan's word was, oh, you'll not surely die. See, one of the things that, uh, that, that, that Satan wants to do, one of the things that sin does for us, is that sin comes between and tries to make a shortcut, saying that you can have what God wants for you, but you can do it a lot quicker than the way God wants you to have it. For instance, one of the things that you'll find, um, you know, God has given us marriage. God has given us family. God has given us all these things. But one of the shortcuts that Satan will give us is uh, developed in lust. We begin to lust after people, and so we'll have a relationship. We'll get into fornication. We'll get into all these other things. Or we'll shortcut, maybe get into pornography, get into all these other things in order to shortcut to try to get to what God intended for good, and that is that true loving relationship that is found in a marriage. And Satan said to Eve that day, Satan said, you'll not surely die. 
They didn't die immediately. But death came, brokenness came, and here we are today. So we got to understand that all the way back. Now, once Adam and Eve had eaten of the fruit, God came, asked them, where are you, Adam? And it wasn't, as I've told you this before, it was not a question of location. It was a question of position because now we're out of position with God. Sin broke the relationship. God intended for us to live in the garden and to live perpetually in relationship with him. But God could not create us to live in that proper relationship without giving us the opportunity to sin. We had to have the freedom. And we did. And so when God came and, and God spoke to Adam and Eve and after they had gotten through most of that conversation along about Genesis chapter 3 verses 22 and 23, God said, now you have eaten and you're like God. You have this knowledge that we have. And so therefore, there's only one thing left and there's another tree standing there. Does anybody know what that other tree was? The tree of life. If Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life, immediately following eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do you know what would have happened? They would have lived perpetually. And how would they have lived perpetually? They would have lived perpetually in brokenness. But God saw and understood that if we continue to live and, and they got a chance to eat of that tree of life and lived, it would live in brokenness and separation and be out of position. And so God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and drove them out into the world and said, go out and you'll make your living by the dust of the ground and the sweat of your brow. And you'll have children in pain and in labor. And I want you to know today that as much as a lot of people like to bring that up and say, oh, how unfair God was, God was just. See, we like to talk about fairness. And so we want to divide. What do we do in our criminal justice system? We take sin and we divide sin up according you know we'll rank it first degree this and second degree that and something else and something else and misdemeanors and felonies folks in god's eyes sin sin and there's a penalty to be paid for sin and it's death and so god realized and, and knew that wasn't that he realized it but god knew and so he drove them out of the garden and that was a just decision by god so that we would not live forever in a broken state because God knew before he created us. The Bible says before the foundations of the world that Christ was ordained to come to be our salvation. To be our salvation. We live in a broken understanding of justice. If you don't believe that, all you have to do is read the court records. We've all been frustrated when we have heard of someone being, a life being taken and the person who took the life put on trial and then some judge just gives them a very small sentence. And we have felt the injustice of that. But you know what our problem is, is we all want mercy without repentance. Let me give you an example. Anybody driven on the interstate lately? Going down the interstate, and while you're going down the interstate, you look up, and here comes, you know, you look in the rearview mirror, and there's a speck way back behind you. In about two minutes, they pass you like you're sitting still, and you're already doing five over. Okay? They come blowing past you, and you get by, and you say, yeah, they're going to mess around and get caught. And, you know, we kind of have that little smirk, you know. Y'all ever had that situation where you get about five miles up the road, and sure enough, there was a trooper sitting there, and there's that person. You know what we all do. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. You got what you deserved. Right? Trooper pulls over, talk to What do we all want when the trooper pulls us over? Do we want justice or do we want mercy? We all want mercy, don't we? I want off with a warning, you know? So you're going on down the road and you make a little headway and everything. And then pretty soon you look in the rear view mirror and here's that little spot back behind you again. And that person comes by you going just as fast as they were before. They did not want mercy, or they wanted mercy, but they didn't want the repentance. It didn't slow them down. You know, we've all probably been guilty of this. Get pulled over, and as soon as the trooper's out of our rearview mirror, we push the accelerator down a little bit faster, right? 
Okay, that's kind of the way we have a tendency to want to do with God, is we want God's mercy, but we don't want the true repentance, the change of life, the change of heart that goes with the mercy that God provides. But I want you to know this morning that our sin is defiance against God's will. Our sin is defiance against God's holiness. Whatever sin it is that plagues your life, hear me clearly today. Whatever sin it is that plagues our life is willful defiance against God. We have set ourselves in a, a, an opposing relationship with God. And because of God's holiness and because of God's just nature, sin that offends God and separates us from him, listen closely, must, underline that, must be justified by repayment or God will be unrighteous and in essence become a fraud. And you say, oh, no, I'm serious. Because justice is a part of the holy nature of God. God, by essence of being God, cannot set aside sin and set aside a penalty for sin and then simply let us off with no consequences or he would be a fraud by the very nature of doing that. Justice is a very real, very significant attribute of God that must be present in his character. Now, you may be sitting here this morning, and this may be the first time you may have heard of justification. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. That's what we receive. I don't know probably more than uh, just a, a couple of times in all of the church services that I've been involved in in my life, starting from the time I was born until now, that I've ever heard someone take the time to sit down and really talk about the justice that God holds himself to. That is a part of the nature of God. But when I began to search this out, it was like a light came on. It was like God opened my eyes to another facet of him and who he is and of his beauty and of his glory and of his holiness. And I sat literally in a maze, in amazement. It is a very real significant attribute of God that must be present in his nature. You know, we've got a lot of truths in this world. We've got mathematical truth and scientific law and we have uh, moral truth. I want you to know today that all truth, all real truth is God's truth. All real truth is God's truth. It comes from God. It is all traced back to the character of God and of his creation. God gives us, has given us, if I walk up here and I walk off this stage, what's going to happen? Am I going to float or am I going to drop? We call that the law of gravity, okay? In of myself, I have no ability to overcome the law of gravity. God set that in motion, okay? I can jump off this stage and flap my arms, and I'm sure it would be quite comical for you all, but the end result is going to be I'm going to hit the floor, Okay, God created that. It is part of his essence. It is part of his nature. That's part of his creation. Anything that we know about the laws of, of our living, any knowledge about anything is just simply the discovery of the truth that already exists in God. We have not created, Einstein did not create the theory of relativity. He may have figured it out, but he didn't create it. He just discovered it because God already had that in motion. God already knew all of those things that go into that, that theory and God already had all that worked out. And it was just discovered knowledge from God. You know, sometimes I think we really should focus a little bit more on who God is and spend our time in the Word because a lot of times I think we, just like when we sing, we sing praise to God based on what God has done for us. Let me give you a for instance real quick. 
I'm going to try to muddle through this and y'all help me, okay? Is everybody here pretty well familiar with the song, How Great Is Our God? I want you to join with me and let's just sing a short portion of that, all right? How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Then all will see how great, how great is our God. Why is God great? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever sat down and thought about the words of the song? See, I think that's one of the problems that we have today. This is a side note. I'm going to just jump off the rails for a minute, all right? Almost a pet peeve. I think sometimes we don't spend enough time reading the message in the song and understanding that message to be applied to our lives. Why is God great? So many times in our lives, he's great because he got me up this morning, because the sun came up, because I've got a car to drive and a roof over my head and clothes on my back and food in the fridge, and I've got a job and I've got this and I've got that and I've got something else. And along the way somewhere we'll throw in because Jesus Christ came and died for me and saved me. And all of those things are fine, and all of those things help to personalize the greatness of God. But let me share this with you. God is great. God is magnificent. He is wonderful. He is amazing. He is good. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He is beyond our comprehension. But I want you to know that God is all of those things without us and without ever doing one single thing for us. Have you ever thought about that? When we sing that song, we ought to be able to sing that song from purity of heart. Now, all of those other things ought to personalize it and deepen it for us, but we ought to recognize that God is good. How great is our God simply because God is great. Begin there and then build on how great God is and begin to thank him. But so many times we're thinking about, oh, because he's done for me. Listen, God was great before you were ever born. God was great before the world was created. God was great before he ever spoke one word. God was great before the very beginning. God is great, always has been, and always will be. Let's give God the praise that God deserves. Let's understand God for who he is. And the more we understand about God, the more we understand about these facets of God, the more we understand the greatness of God and the goodness of God. Why? Because, folks, of all of the proclaimed gods in the world, our God, the only God, is the only God that ever came to reconcile anyone to himself. There's no other God that ever came to reconcile anyone to themselves. There's no other God that has the power. There's no other God that ever came up out of the grave. Folks, Jesus Christ came to purchase eternal life for us, and he made it possible for it to be conferred on us, to be given to us by salvation, so that we might be in relationship with him. Heirs with Christ adopted into the family of God. There's no other God out there that wants to do that. Other gods want to control you or their people want to control you or they want to do this, that, something, other else. We're the only religion where we come willing to God and submit ourselves and say, God, here I am. Take me and use me and make me what you want me to be. It's because of the nature of God. Look with me in the book of Romans chapter 3 this morning. I said earlier, as you're turning, I said earlier that as I was reading, been doing some reading recently and, and praying and looking at some things that I came across a passage of Scripture. We're going to read it a little bit later. It's not this one, but this one is also speaking about the th same thing, and I've read it before. And I can't tell you how many times that I've read the Bible and I have jumped over the word just that God is just. And I'd never properly sat down and examined what that really meant. But I began to search this out. 
And I promise you, I don't have a full, complete understanding of it, and you won't either. But it's opened my eyes and helped me to see my God in a greater way. Romans chapter 3, we're going to begin reading this morning in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all, notice this next two words, who believe. How is the righteousness of God conferred? It is conferred to us, given to us, through Christ, to and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified, there's that word, we become justified through Jesus by believing on him freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation, that means substitutionary sacrifice, freely by, or excuse me, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he now we have to be justified but God demonstrated through his righteousness that he might be just and our justifier or the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus because it is part of God's nature, God had to live by the rules that is a part of his nature, the laws that make up his nature, and that is the law of justification. And he has to abide according to that, or he's a fraud. He becomes a liar. <clears throat> and so he sent Jesus Christ that we might have that. Now notice in verse 22, go back to verse 22. God's righteousness is available to whom? All who believe. Okay, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It puts us at a level playing field, uh, a level field at the foot of the cross. Everybody needs salvation for all have sinned. And remember what we've been talking about, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of this and remind you of this, because we are the product of two, two types of sin. First and foremost is our inherited sin that goes back to now you figure out why I'm talking about Genesis 3 when we started. The inherited sin that goes back to Adam. We are born into, we have the inherited sin of Adam. And then we all have the personal sins. Not a person here that hasn't sinned. We have, you know, somebody hasn't told a lie. Some, you know, just taken something on down the line. And the Bible says that if you break one of the law, how many of you may be broken? All of them. Okay? To break one is to break all. We've all sinned. And we all fall short of God. So we have, we have in our lives the inherited sin and the personal sin of God. Now, in Romans 6.23, okay, all sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, here is the punishment for the wages of sin is death okay punishment that's the wages god has set that aside and god said in genesis chapter 3 if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall die okay adam and eve didn't drop dead as soon as they ate it it wasn't poison to their physical it was deadly to their spiritual it was deadly to their soul. It separated them from God. And spiritual death came, which then eventually brings about the physical death. The wages of sin is death. And then right in the middle of that, praise God, is that but. But the gift of God, the justice of God is this. The gift of God is eternal life in not in your bank account, not in your name, not in your family history, not in the house you live in, not in your car, not in your job. 
the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because God is just, he cannot make a rule, establish a penalty, and then not follow through with the punishment prescribed unless an equal or higher substitute is provided. And folks, that provision, the only provision, is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our, and here's that word I mentioned a while ago, Jesus is our propitiation. Mentioned several times in the Bible. We don't use that word uh, in our modern language today, but the word propitiation means that Jesus died a substitutionary death on our behalf. When we stand before God the Father, and he looks at us and says, why are you here? The only answer that any of us have is the same answer that the thief on the cross had when the Jesus Christ said, this day you'll be in paradise with me. When he went to that paradise and he was asked, why are you here? Here's our answer. The only answer we have. Because the man in the middle, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Because he is my propitiation. He died in my stead. He died as my substitute. He carried my shame. He carried my sin. He carried that burden. He carried my death. And because of him and in receiving him and believing in him, I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he said that I can come. Jesus is the only substitute. Verse 24 says, being justified freely, we are justified by him. I want to give you a real quick walkthrough because maybe you have heard a lot of biblical terms that you didn't understand. I'm not going to cover all of them, but we're going to cover three of them this morning. We're going to begin with redemption. Okay? There was a price that had to be paid. Let's go back. Many of you are older, so you'll remember this. How many of you remember glass soda bottles? How many of you ever had, whenever you come, you know, Saturday comes or Friday or whatever shopping day was, and you got ready to go, however many cases of sodas you had in the house, you know, the, the cardboard cartons go through and you make sure all the bottles are accounted for and you take them out and you're stacking them things in the car. And then when you get to the grocery store, what do you do? You go in and get a cart. You bring it out. And you set all your soda bottles in. When you go in, you go up to the girl at the counter and you let her know she counts. And there was a cart there and you set all the soda bottles in the cart. And then you got what? You got credit because you had done what? You had redeemed your soda bottles. Another thing, and I had one here a while back and I was going to bring it and I, I don't remember now exactly where it's at. Another thing that you used to get at the grocery store was what? Anybody remember green stamps? Or the y, y and something another that had some initials or something other, S and K or something other like that, you know, you got those stamps, you know, however much your grocery bill was, you got so many of them and you got a little card, looks like a little bingo card, you know, and you lick the back of those things and you'd paste them on there. When you got so many cards filled, then you did what? You redeemed them. A coupon. It's written on about a, a tenth of a cent of paper, okay? But you carry a coupon into to the store and you redeem the coupon, okay? It says this little piece of paper that's really not worth anything, but what is written on it, the authority that is written on it, makes it valuable up to this amount, okay? So the word redemption is that Jesus Christ came to be our substitute. He died in our stead. He carried our sin, carried our punishment. He placed on us his righteousness. And through that, we have rede redemption, which simply means this. The just payment for my sin. Where do we begin in our walk with Christ? We begin at salvation. We are, at that day, at that time, we are redeemed. Two things happen when we invite Jesus Christ to come into our life. Number one, redemption. The next thing that happens immediately is justification. Because in the born-again experience... 
Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. In the born again experience, when Jesus Christ comes into our life and we are born again, the next thing that happens is justification. Okay? He said he freely justified. Justification is applied to our lives. When we are justified, it's a big word. Nobody really understands exactly maybe what it means. You, you haven't heard it. Here's a simple way of putting it. Born again, justified, simply means this. Just as if I'd never sinned. The slate is wiped clean. The pronouncement of guilt is wiped clean in my life. Just as if I'd never sinned. The new birth, the, the truly born again, covered by Jesus' blood experience. We are redeemed by his blood and we are justified. Then after those two things happen, the next thing is, is the work of sanctification, the process where the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to dig into our conscience, convict us of things. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to talk like that anymore. We're not going to do all those things. And that word is sanctification. And sanctification is simply the outflow of our new life in Christ as a result of salvation and the submission of our life to God's word and God's will. Thus, we will live a life with changed words, changed thoughts, changed actions. Every part of me begins to resemble Christ's likeness and all of these things together. Redemption, justification, sanctification are all necessary, necessary parts of a growing, maturing walk with Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Paul wrote there and he said, therefore, having been justified by faith, that is our belief, our belief in Christ, that he is the son of God, he came to save us, he is our propitiation, justified by faith, we have Peace with God because we have met the standards of justice before God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to have peace with God in any other way. You're not going to go sit under a shade tree and sit there and meditate long enough to ever get peace with God. Okay? You're not going to go off on some adventure by yourself and spend days and days and days out there and ever come to true peace with God. You're going to get peace with God when you come before Jesus Christ, invite him to come into your life and ask him to save your soul. And you live according to God's word and the Holy Spirit will bring peace that passes understanding into our lives. Salvation through Jesus Christ is the sufficient payment and the only sufficient payment for the consequence of our sin that is declared by God, the wages of sin is death. Verse 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation, God sent Jesus Christ to demonstrate his righteousness on our behalf. God, by his nature, cannot be justified in forget. Listen. We get this in courts. We get this, we get this in debt today, okay? You ever heard of write-offs or settles, you know, settlement? You get behind on your credit card, you're getting in debt, and you're maybe about to go into foreclosure or something other. You call a credit card company, say, look, this is hopeless. I'll do my best to settle with you. And what will they do? They'll write off part of that debt, Okay? We live like that. That's, that's a little bit of mercy applied, okay? The only mercy that we have applied is that Jesus Christ has come to be our propitiation, to be our Savior. God, by his nature, cannot be justified in forgiving sins without a full payment for our sins. If there was any other way, Jesus in the garden cried out, Father, if there's any other way, if there was any other way, it would have been a tragedy for Jesus to die on our behalf. But there was no other way. God, by his nature, cannot be justified in forgiving sins without full payment for our sins. In reality, these write-offs that we've grown accustomed to and things like that in our society, settlements, whatever you want to call them, 
are not justified because the debt isn't paid. Somebody's got to bear that. In true justice, repayment or satisfaction of the debt, the sin debt, must be carried out to the letter. A lot of people think that because I'm a good person, because of this, because of that, God's going to overlook me, God's going to overlook this sin, so on and so forth, you know, whatever. Folks, that's not what the Word of God says, and that is not the nature of God. Salvation through Jesus Christ is the only just payment for our sin, except our own punishment and death for all eternity. The eternal punishment and death penalty for our sins, listen closely to this, was heaped upon Christ at Calvary. Think about for those of you that grew up on a farm using scoop, scoop shovels full of sin, one after the other, heaped upon Christ until he was carrying the sin burden of every sin all the way from Genesis 3 all the way through to the very last day that God allows this world to stand. All of that was heaped upon Jesus. That means it's your sin, my sin, everybody else's sin, the sin of the world that's going rampant today, the sin of our uh, leadership in our land, the sin of the politicians, the sin of the poor people, the sin of the rich people. It was all heaped upon Christ. But because of that, the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins, according to verse 26, demonstrates God's love and true righteousness and shows that he is just as he justifies the lives of those whose lives already rely on Jesus Christ in faith. God's justice is an inseparable part of his holy nature. I'm going to give you a quote from a, a, a website that I found. I was reading some on this. It's called Core Christian Beliefs. Listen to this. Justification is a legal declaration from God that you are innocent from sin. Instead, you are made right before him by Jesus Christ. It is our impurity made perfect by the sinless, blameless life of Jesus Christ. It is God's perfection through Jesus covering our imperfections and bringing us to the restored relationship with him. It all goes back to Jesus. It's not about your works. It's not about anything that you can achieve. It all goes back to Jesus. Turn quickly with me over to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is where I was looking the other day, and I came across this. I've read this how many times? I shared this with Sister Barbara uh, last week whenever she came in, and we prayed about her salvation. This is one of the scriptures that we talked about, and it came back to my mind, and this word just stood out like it was under a spotlight. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him, with, or excuse me, with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So many times I focus on that word faith, how faithful God is, how faithful God is. But I miss the facet of the being of God that he is also a just God. And that he must work within the capacity of his justice. Verse 6 says that we have failed, or excuse me, says that we have fellowship. If we say we have fellowship with him, but we do not, we walk in darkness, then we are liars. We're not to be living in the same sin that he redeemed us from and brought us out of. Our lives should be different through salvation. Verse 7 talks about our sanctification. If we walk in the light, as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his, sin, uh, his, his son, cover, cleanses us from all sin. Sanctification is walking in the light, the new life, the submission to God's word. Verse 8 says that we can be deceived. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. A lot of people today want to stand up and say, I don't have any sin. I'm a good person. Good, being a good person is not going to get you to heaven. It's the redemption of Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says that he is faithful and righteous in the forgiveness of our sins. He is faithful and just. Matthew Henry puts it like this. God is faithful to his covenant and word, wherein he has promised forgiveness to penitent, believing confessors. He is just to himself and his glory, who has provided such a sacrifice by which his righteousness is declared in the justification of sinners. He is just to his son, who has not only sent him for such service, but promised that those who come through him shall be forgiven on his account, on Jesus' account. We're forgiven on his account. That goes to John 3.16. But one of our problems is that we read John 3.16, but we never listen or read John 3.18. So we're going to read John 3.16, 17, and 18 this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved jesus was the only just sacrifice but look at what verse 18 says he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, a lot of people want to shake their little bony fingers at God, little human fingers at God, and say, God, how dare you if you're such a loving God? How dare you send somebody to hell? How dare you cast people into hell? John 3.18 says you condemned yourself because you refused to believe. That's what John 3, 18 says. God simply is just, and God has said, this is the penalty. And if you cross the line, God did not condemn Eve to hell. Eve condemned herself, or at least to death, and separation from God. She did it when she ate of the tree. Adam did it whenever they ate of the tree together. That was the condemnation, is that we sinned against God. And because of sin... If you are still living in sin, if you find yourself, maybe you've been professing with your mouth. Notice it said confessors. If you've been professing with your mouth, but Christ isn't living in your heart, the scripture said that you're still living in darkness and the truth is not in you. you say, preacher, you're being awful hard. No, I'm telling you something. I love every one of you enough to tell you what the truth of God's word is because I don't want any of y'all to die and go to hell. I don't want anybody watching dying and going to hell. I don't want anybody I know dying and going to hell. But people are dying and going to hell on a daily basis because they are not living according to the word of God. I love you. And I love you enough to be able to be honest with you and to tell you and show you what God's word says. But because of sin, we are in a hopeless, helpless condition without Jesus Christ. If you're still in your sin, your situation is hopeless and helpless, and there's only one way, and it's Jesus. The punishment and death that Jesus suffered lovingly and willingly on our behalf to provide the redemption and atonement for our sins is the price paid necessary to justify God in forgiving us and placing on our lives the justification of Jesus Christ. Because he is the higher substitute for our sins. Earlier I said there had to be an equivalent or higher. You know what? I believe that the mercies of God are higher than our sins. I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is higher than our sins. I believe that Jesus' life was worth more than all of our sins. And that God sent him to be our propitiation, to be our substitute. Folks, it's simple. It's this simple. The debt. By the nature of God, the debt has to be paid. If we reject Jesus Christ as our Savior, then guess who is going to pay the debt? 
you are. And it will be an eternal payment that never ends. Romans 6.23 said the wages of sin is death. But, but what? But God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God. I want to share a passage that I have been reading and rereading and studying and meditating on. And the more that I read it and the study on it, the bigger it grows, the more important it grows, the more I realize it. You can sum up salvation. This is the gospel in one verse. And there's a lot of those that you can find in scripture. But listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. You need to underline this in your Bible. You need to put a marker there. You need to open your Bible and go back to that and read it and read it and read it and read it and study it and read it and pray over it and read it some more. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I'm going to break this down real easy. For he, God the Father, made him God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, Jesus Christ. By nature, God is a just God. It had the Father sent Jesus the Son. He was sinless. He was blameless. He was the only substitutionary payment that could take care of the justice required by God for our sin debt. He who knew no sin, or he sent him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That when the blood of Jesus is applied, we carry the righteousness of God. We are justified. We now stand as an heir and a child of God. But folks, one way or the other, the debt's got to be paid. Jesus is the only substitute. The only sacrifice by whom atonement can be made complete for our sin so that we can become acceptable to God. And I want to share this one thing with you. Our men's group I handed out, and I'll be glad to make anybody a copy. Back, I believe it was in the 1400s, there was a, a preacher, Jonathan Edwards, and he preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And if you've never read it, you need to get a copy of it. You need to look it up and you need to read it. I'll be glad to make a copy if you can't get one. But what, what Jonathan Edwards says is that sinners are sitting in the gracious hand of God and, at any, and literally held over the fires of hell to receive their just reward. And at any moment, by God's sovereignty, that hand can be removed. And that's anyone who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord right now. That's anyone. Why is God tearing? Why is it? That you have not gone there yet. Let me tell you why. However long it was from the time you were born on this earth until you got saved, if you're a Christian. However long it's been since you've been born on this earth until today. Hearing about the justice of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he came to do, and the mandate that has been given for our salvation, the only thing that is keeping any of us or has kept any of us out of hell before we got saved or up till today when you have this opportunity to be saved is simply divine patience. It is God's long suffering that has kept us out of hell and given us space to repent through Jesus Christ. Today, you have the space. God has blessed you with life. You're here. You've heard. I don't know what else I could tell you from the word of God today. That could convince you more than what we've already shown. About the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the need for salvation for everyone who is in sin. Divine patience is allowing a space but there's going to come a time when the divine patience is going to stop and God says it's time. Don't wait until it's too late. We're going to have our song of response this morning. I pray, right, matter of fact, as they're coming, I, I just ask us, let's go to the Lord in prayer as they're coming and preparing. Father God, I ask you right now, dear God, that you would come in your mercies and grace this morning. And Father, if there's anyone here that has rejected you thus far in their life, 
God, that you would extend the divine patience. The scripture says that we don't come to you unless we are drawn. So God, would you send the Holy Spirit right now and would you begin in a magnificent way, in a powerful way to draw anyone, God, that does not know you as their Savior, would you draw them to you today that they might come to know you and this would be the day that that propitiation takes place, the day of their redemption, the day of their justification, where their slate could be wiped clean, born again, made new, just as if they'd never sinned, and begin immediately in that walk of sanctification where their life is fully submitted to you and they grow in Christ's likeness from this day forward as they learn more and more of your word and more of your will for their lives. So God, would you come right now and Lord, would you manifest the word that you've given today touch the lives of your people with it and draw us to you today may we respond to your word today in the name of jesus christ we pray amen